Hello, my name is Philip Cramp and I'm a domain architect at Red Hat and I work for the public sector Synergy Tiger team. Today we will be deploying an OpenShift 4 cluster. We will be using user provisioned infrastructure or UPI and we will be doing this on an OpenStack environment where we will kind of simulate a partially disconnected setup. We will be using a bastion jump box as well as a utility VM which will serve as our simplistic container registry web server and NFS server for our installation. I've set up some variables that we will be using to make this easier and reference things down the line such as GUID which is just a unique identifier for our shared lab environment to ensure that I've got a unique cluster name and everything and don't step on the toes of anyone else who is working on this OpenStack cluster. Uh, additionally set up AF API FIP which is our API endpoint for the OpenStack cluster, which we'll need for the installer to talk to OpenStack. Additionally, the OpenShift DNS zone, which will be our base domain that we'll be using to reach all of our endpoints. And a lot of the commands, I've gone ahead and pre-written them and so that I can easily copy them, paste them, to kind of eliminate any of the typos as much as possible, as well as speed things along. There are also a few files that have been staged and we will examine those before I run them to give you guys kind of a heads up of what we're going to be doing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to create a variable that we can reference throughout the installation process. So we're going to set an OCP environment variable for OCP release which will be equal to version 4.3.8. This is the version we're going to start with, and then we're going to go ahead and make it available to bash immediately with this source. Next thing we want to do is download the OpenShift CLI tool that matches this release. So what we want to do is reference that same OCP release variable so we keep things consistent. And we just want to w get that file, pull it down to the local machine. Now that you can see it's already quickly been downloaded, what we want to do next is go ahead, extract that client, and place it directly in the path so that we can easily reference it going forward. So to do that, we're going to just untar it and copy it over to the proper location. Next, what we're going to do is let's validate that it works. All we have to do there is just do a witch OC, and we can see it's right where we put it. And we can move on to the next step, which is to set up some bash completion for our OC command. This way, we can do tab completion, uh, make things a little bit easier for ourselves down the road, and allow us to complete all our commands simpler. All right, now let's go ahead and SSH over to our utility VM. We're gonna use this a lot. It's gonna first work as our simplistic local container registry. It's also gonna host some ignition files on a simplistic HTTPD server, as well as an NFS server for storage once we get our cluster up and running. Now that we're on the server, let's use Podman to go ahead and pull just an image to make sure that Podman's working. We can get out to the internet and we can pull down an image that we're going to need in a few minutes. So Podman is basically the Docker command, but unlike Docker, you don't have to run it as root. So this allows us to run it as a user. So we can see with the Podman pull, make sure that works. Now that the image is pulled down, let's go ahead and do a Podman run, ensure that we can run a container image as a user without the root permission. We'll also take a look at the release, make sure it's the version that it says it is. And we can compare that to what is expected. So you can see here, as expected, now we're running a UBI 7.7 .7 image. So it is Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.7. .7. Pretty much as expected, no surprises. And now we can go ahead and get ready to create our container registry. 
So first we're going to have to do some directory creation. Uh, our container registry is going to need a off cert and data folder. Next we need to change the owner to our local user. So we're going to take those existing folders we just made, do a recursive change owner to ourselves. Next, we're going to go ahead and create the certificate our registry is going to use. So we're just going to CD into the registry directory we just created for the certs. And now that we're in the directory, we're going to run an OpenSSL command to generate the certificate that we're going to be using. And you can see we're going to do an RSA 4096. Uh, we're going to make it good for a year even though this for this demo purpose we don't need it that long but just to give you guys some some of the the switches and stuff for when you create this on your own now we're going to fill it out with the information that it's requesting most of these values don't matter i'm just going to fill it out for myself here the only one that is critical is your common name so the rest of these fill it out for your own local use case now in this common name, this has to be exact for the certificate to work. This has to be what your utility VM is going to be. In my case, utilityvm.example.com. And just go ahead and put in my email and finish this off. So we now have a generated cert. Next thing we're going to do is create a simple password authentication file. And we're going to use this for logging into the registry. So we're just going to do something simple. We're just going to do the username OpenShift password Red Hat. Uh, we're going to use this to basically provide just super simplistic authentication into our registry server. Now we have all the pieces to create our registry server. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and run a container that's just a mirror registry. We're going to set the port to 5000 5000. We're going to set it to use basic password off. We're going to tell it to use the certificate we just created. And it's going to be set so that it automatically restarts in case the VM gets rebooted for any reason. And we don't have to come back in and set this up again. So now it's going to run through everything and it, everything should be up and running. It says it's started. Now we can go ahead and let's try to connect to the server. So we're going to curl the endpoint we just hit. We can see we got a certificate error because it doesn't trust the cert we just created. So why don't we go ahead and run the same th thing with a dash K option which turns off the certificate verification and just make sure everything works. All right, so that's what we expected. So why don't we go ahead and fix the trust issue? What we're going to do is first we're going to copy the certificate to the system trust store. So the default rel8 location is etcpkica trust source anchors. So we're going to copy this cert over to there. And then we're going to go ahead and update the CA trust. You're just using the command sudo update ca trust. So now the system should trust that cert that we generated a few minutes ago. Let's go ahead and try it again without the dash k. So it actually validates the certificate chain. And now we connect with the certificate in place. Alright, now let's go ahead and clear the screen. And let's go ahead and try logging into our new container registry. So you can see our simple OpenShift username, Red Hat password. Next, we're going to go ahead and try to use it. So we're going to pull down the UBI image again. Next, we're going to go ahead and use the podman tag command 
to tag it from the source to our new internal registry. So again, just like you would use Docker, we're going to do a podman tag. And of course, if you know Docker, you know we then have to do a podman push. So we're going to push that up to our new re internal registry. You can see it's pushing it all in place. Now it's in place. Remember we created the folder structure earlier where it's going to store all these. We can go ahead and do an ls on that folder we created. You can see the docker registry subfolders that it automatically created and you can see that UVI7 image right there. So now the utility VM set up how we want so we can go ahead and log out. And let's go ahead and try connecting from the bastion. Let's clear the screen again. And try connecting to that new container registry. And we ran into that certificate issue. Now the way we're going to fix it is basically the exact same way we did before. We know where we put that original certificate, so we'll go ahead and SCP that. And it's going to go to the exact same folder, only locally on the bastion, so the utility VM. So it's that same SCPKI CHRUST source anchors. We're just going to go ahead and copy it directly there. It's already down, so now we need to do the exact same command again. So we're going to do a sudo update chrust. Now everything should be ready. We can go ahead and test it again. And now it works. So let's go ahead and do a podman login. We'll log into our new server. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is generate a full secret config file that we're going to be merging in a second. So you can see we logged in. That file has been created in our home directory. And it tells it which server and port that login is for. Next we're going to need the credentials for all of the online uh, sources that we're going to mirror. So what you're going to do is go to cloud.redhat.com and we're going to go to this Red Hat OpenShift Cluster Manager. And from here we're going to just click on that little blue Cluster Manager. Oops, my session timed out. So we're going to go ahead and log in again. Alright, now it took us right to where we wanted to go. We're going to create this Create Cluster button. Now from here, you want to create the, click on the Red Hat OpenShift container platform. And this brings you to all the providers available. As we mentioned earlier, this is going to be a Red Hat OpenStack platform install. So we're going to go ahead and click on that option for today, but you have the rest of them here in case you're doing it in another environment down the road. And again, we're doing user provision to install or UPI. So we're going to go ahead and click on that option for our demo today. And what you want to do is click on the copy pull secret. So you can see it's copied to my notepad. And we can go ahead and go back to the terminal. And we're going to echo that and output it to a file that we can then merge in a second. Make sure you include the single quotes around the entire pull secret. And then put the output and put the location you want it to go. In our case, it's going to go to home OCP pull secret dot JSON. Now we can go ahead and do an LS just to see that both the files we created are there. So we got pull secret and pull secret config. Now we need to merge them into a single pull secret the OpenShift installer can only take a single file, so that's why we're doing this. And we can do another LS, see that the merge is now there. Let's go ahead and clear it and move on. Now we're going to go ahead and create a few variables for use throughout our installation parts here. So we're going to create uh, first a local registry variable that's just going to tell it basically where our local registry is. In our case, the utilityvm.example.com on port 5000. 
So next, we're going to create a local repository variable. This is going to tell it, basically we were doing OCP4, the OpenShift4 repository location. Uh, the next one we're going to use is the location of our merged pull secret that we just created. So this will be local secret JSON. And then we're going to create a product repo variable. This is just going to say that we're going to be using the OpenShift release dev uh, as our source. And then our final variable for right now we're creating is the release name. So this is just going to be the images that we're going to be using, in our case OCP-release. And then just like before, we're going to go ahead and set the source so that the variables are immediately available. Now what we're going to do, let's go ahead and clear again, uh, just to make things clean, is we're going to set up the mirroring of all these images to our local registry that we just created. So to do that we're going to use an OC ADM command and you're going to see all the variables we just created. So we're telling it we're, where our release mirror is, where we're pulling it from, where it's going to, and the two release images that we're doing. So we're just going to go ahead and kick that off and now it's going to start mirroring all of the images in this case 803 images that it found to our local registry so that we can use that for our install instead of going back out to the internet during the OpenShift installer. Now while it's copying all this down it's going to take several minutes and we're just going to go ahead and let this run and then come back when it's complete. So now as you can see several minutes later everything should be downloaded and ready to use. So the next thing we're going to do is let's go ahead and validate that all the images we put pulled down are ready to use and available. So let's try it with an image and it helps if you have the correct version. So I uh, have 4.3.0 and remember I said we're doing 4.3.8. So those are the images we pulled down so we'll fix that and now it's pulling down the correct version. So once this is downloaded and ready, we can go ahead and use an OCADM command to look at the info in it. And we're going to do that in order to validate it is indeed a 438 image. And as you can see here, it is exactly the version we expected. And we are now ready to move on to the next steps. So now what we need to do is pull down and extract the actual OpenShift installer. So now we move, we pull down the installer. Let's go ahead and move it to the path just like we did with the previous OC command so that we can easily reference it. Okay, now as always, let's validate that it is in fact where we want it to and we have permissions to access it. So let's go ahead and use it and we'll just do a OpenShift dash install space version. And you can see it's there and it is 4.3.8 as well. So now we can go ahead and get ready to use it. So first thing we need to do is create a folder to store all the files that we'll be using throughout the installation process. So we're going to make a openstack-upi folder in our home directory. And now we're just going to go ahead and change into that directory. Now there's several pieces of information we're going to need to gather before we run through the installer that we're going to have to use. So what you want to do is gather this information, put it someplace safe that you can easily reference. So I have a notepad open on my other monitor. I'm just going to go ahead and get this information. So first thing we're going to do is grab the GUID. So this is, remember, just a unique identifier I'm using. So I'm going to grab that. And then we're going to grab that API endpoint for the OpenStack. So 
So grabbing that uh, that endpoint, keeping that safe. Next thing we're going to need is the OpenShift DNS zone. Remember, this is our base domain that we're going to use for the installer that all of our machines are going to follow. So that's that blue OSP OpenTLC.com. Now we're going to need a couple of files. So remember, we have that merge pull secret. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to grab that. Copy the entire thing. And then the last one we're going to need is that cert we created for our OpenShift registry. So remember, we saved that to the local machine. Just catting that file. We're going to copy that entire thing again from begin to the end and put that in someplace safe so that we can use that in the installer. So now we're going to go ahead and clear the screen. And now we can go ahead and actually kick off the install itself. So we're just going to do an OpenShift install, create install config to that directory setup. So this is going to store all of the artifacts. We're going to select our SSH key. So this is the one in my home directory, the public key, of course. We're doing OpenStack, so make sure you select that. That's the, the project that we're going to use. Now we're going to use the external network option. And remember, this is the API endpoint I told you for OpenStack. So we're going to grab that, look at that, and it's that 117 address. And now we're going to use a flavor that we have set up in our OpenStack that's a 4C16 30D. So that's 4 cores, 16 gigs, 30 gig disk. And our base domain is that blue.osp.opentlc.com. The cluster name is just going to be that GUID, just unique identifier. And then the pull secret is going to be that merged pull secret. So again, you're going to want to copy and paste that entire thing. And then this is going to generate your file. So now there's a few more changes we're going to have to make to this. Because again, we're doing UPI. So what we're going to do is we're going to just vim that file, open it up, and make the changes that we have to do. So this is what it looks like. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set our workers to zero for the replicas. So since this is UPI, we just don't want it to stand them up on their own. We're going to do that manually and if later in the install. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and explicitly specify the platform parameters for the control plane. So we did specify a default earlier. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to specify that specifically. It's actually going to be the same values, but this will just give you an example so that if you want to do it uh, differently than your defaults, you have the syntax so that you can do it in the future. Now, remember this is YAML, so you need two spaces in the, each location that you're going indenting in order for it to properly be read. Make sure you watch for typos. So the next thing we need is that machine cider network. So this is the network that you're going to be using. At, for all your machines and this has to be correct because otherwise when your machines start to come up they'll get an IP address that you can't actually reach. So in my case I will be using a 192.168.47 network. So 
the next thing we're going to do is we're going to kind of turn off the trunk support. So we don't need it for this install and it'll make things more complicated in case you do make typos to try to troubleshoot and go through. So we're just going to go ahead and eliminate that for now. So now we need to add a couple of files or parameters to the end of this. So we're going to go all the way to the end and append and this is going to be our endpoints. So telling it basically what mirrors we need to use as well as the trust bundle. So we're going to add the cert. So you can see here the mirrors, they're pointing to our utility VM. They're saying what the source of that mirror is. And in the trust bundle, we need to grab the cert that we saved. Now, the thing to remember is again, you have to have those two spaces at the beginning of each line. So once you have that all set, make sure you keep all your spaces proper. Make We can uh, look over the file, double check for any typos, mistakes, and then we'll be ready to move on to actually creating some of the files we're going to be using. So now we can go ahead, do a final review, make sure everything still looks good. And then save and quit. So now that we have our file, we think it should be all good to go. We want to go ahead and make a backup directory. And we're going to put a copy of this file over there. So we're just going to put it in home back, backup. And the reason we're doing this and moving the, the file over there is once you run the installer, this file will be consumed. And if you need to ever recover, come back, if you want to save it for future reuse, you need to do that before you run it. So now we're about ready to start using these files. Let's go ahead and clear the screen. So we got a clean space to work from. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start using the files we've been generating. So there are a bunch of manual steps we're going to have to do because we're doing UPI. Normally the installer and IPI will take care of all these things for you, but we're going through them manually. So if you do tree, you can see the output of all the files that this installer consumed and generated. Should be, in our case, around two directories and 41 files. And what we're going to do next is basically we want to set the masters as unschedulable. This will prevent things like the ingress controllers from being scheduled on them and force them to wait for our worker nodes to come online. So I just went ahead and ran a quick little Ansible script that took care of that for me. Uh, we can take a look at the file though. I'm just going to cat it so you can see. And I left off the L. So you can see all that did. So if you wanted to do it manually, just look at it, see master schedule. We changed that to false with the Ansible script, but you can do it manually just as well. So next thing we're ready to do is we're going to go ahead and remove the master manifests. We're going to be creating these manually in a few minutes, so we're just going to go ahead and clear out the ones that were generated by the installer. Next thing we want to do is create some ignition files. So we're going to do open shift install create ignition configs and the directory of course, the one we've been using, our OpenStack UPI. And if we do a tree, you can see how things have changed again. So we now have one directory with six files in it. And we're going to set up another environment variable that we're going to use in these upcoming sections. So we're going to set up an infra ID, which is just going to identify our OpenStack cluster that we're using. This will help us for if we need to clear things up in the end, uh, we can identify them with this infra ID as well as if you do have multiple clusters and multiple open stacks identifying which one you're running on in case you need to troubleshoot. So now that we have our infra ID set, we're going to go ahead and set the source again so it's immediately available. 
And now we're going to need to make some changes to our ignition file. We're going to set up DHCP. Now, ignition files are Base64 encoded, so rather than manually modifying it, we just have this Python script that's already been pre-staged. We're going to go ahead and take a look at that. And you can see here what we've done is basically already written out what we want the ignition file to say. It's going to input that at Base64 encoded and append it to the bottom of our file. Now this script is not idempotent at all, it just appends these lines to the bottom of the file. So we want to make sure we only run this once. So now we've run that, it's gone ahead and appended those items to the bottom of our file. So now the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and create the ignition files that we need for our masters. So we're going to use that infraid environment variable and a for loop to generate all three of these files. So here you can see you've got the, the host name is using that variable. We're going to do some Python and we're going to be setting the ignition as well as the files. And we're just going to go ahead and execute that. Now if we do an ls we can see we've got master 0, master 1, and master 2. So now we're ready to do the next step. So unfortunately our ignition files are too big for our OpenStack environment to host and pass through normally. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an HTTPD server that we set up on our utility VM. You can use basically anything that you want to host these files. It could be an MS on S3, it can be the Swift storage on OpenStack. But in our case, I'm just set up a simple HTTPD server on the utility VM, and we're just going to copy this file over there, fix the permissions, and put everything in place. So, first thing we need to do is copy this file to our utility VM. Now you can see it quickly copied over there. Next thing we're going to do is go ahead and mod those permissions like I mentioned. And we're going to go ahead and quickly move it to the correct location and do a restore con on it so that it's immediately available. Let's test this with a wget. We'll try pulling it down. I pulled down so we can go ahead and get ready to use it. So we have this bootstrap that's too large to use. We have it hosted. We need a dummy stub file. Uh, basically all this ignition file is going to do is point to our real ignition file. So we're just going to create a super simple one that basically points to our utility vm example.com slash bootstrap dot ign. And that's all this ignition is going to do. It's nothing special about it other than it's a pointer to our real ignition file. So we're just going to generate this file real quick. All right. So now we're almost ready to create our bootstrap node. First though, we need to set up the network communications manually since this is UPI. So we're going to go ahead and create a network security group for the masters. And this will be for our ingress port. So you can see this is using 192.168.47.5. We're just going to go ahead and tell it to create. And then as soon as this is done, we're going to basically do the same thing except for our worker nodes. We're going to do an ingress port here as well. You can see this is for the worker security group and it is on 47.7. So now that we have these two commands run, what we're going to do is ask OpenStack to assign them to a floating IP for the external access. So we're going to create an InfraID API port, uh, InfraID ingress port, and then we're going to take a look at them. So running the floating IP list, you can see there's our 47.7, our 47.5. And that last one, 47.19, is actually for my bastion that I'm using. Alright, so 
Now we can finally create the port for the bootstrap node itself. So what we're going to do with this is do an OpenStack port create. We're going to do it for allowing 47.5.6 and .7. And now we're going to create the actual bootstrap node itself. And we're going to set it which ignition file to use, which are the ones we just generated. So that's where we're telling it use the bootstrap ignition that we created. And it's going to use that FRID bootstrap port. And now we're just going to execute that. It just takes a few minutes for this to execute. Okay, so now we have that up. Let's go ahead and SSH over to our bootstrap node. So we're just going to use our public key and we're going to go to that new bootstrap node. So as soon as we're on the node, what we're going to do is we're going to view the node, the node's logs so we can watch the boot queue processes. And we're going to do that with journal control dash b dash f dash u on that boot cube dash service dot service. And we're just going to let these logs run. We're going to move this off to the side so that we can keep working. So what we're going to end up watching for eventually is what we want to see is the bootstrap will say that it is unhealthy. Uh, waiting on the cluster Etsy, D, Etsy control and it's going to keep waiting for the masters to be added to the cluster. So once we see that we're ready to go with our next step which is actually adding the masters themselves. So now you can see our uh, boot cube is waiting on that Etsy D control so that means the masters are uh, needed. So let's go ahead and create the ports that the masters are going to need. So we'll kick that off, get those ready. Now the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and actually create the three masters. So this will be the first actual nodes of our cluster finally coming up. So you can see we're using the OCP 4.3 uh, Red Hat Core OS image and there's master zero. master one and master two so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for the boot cube to come to tearing down temporary bootstrap control plane boot cube dot service complete on the right and on the left on our bastion what we're gonna go ahead and do is run the open shift install and we're going to tell it to wait for the bootstrap to complete and of course our directory that we have been using for all of this so we're going to go ahead and let this run for a while and when it's done we'll be ready to move on to creating our workers so you can now see that our bootstrap of the masters is completed you can see on the left we've got the api up and it now says the bootstrapping is complete and we can remove those resources on our boot cube, you can see the boot cube service is completed. So we'll go ahead and disconnect from that. And then let's uh, clear the clear the page again for a clean working space on our bastion. And then we're just going to go ahead and delete those resources that we no longer need. So we're going to do an OpenStack server delete. And then the infra ID boots Strap. and then we're going to delete that port we created so same thing open stack except now it's going to be port delete and then infrastrap infra id bootstrap dash port so those are all cleared up now we want to interact with our cluster to do some setup so what we're going to do is export the cube config that got put into the OpenStack auth cube config. So we're just using some Ansible to export that cube config. And then we're going to do the source so that it's immediately available. 
And now we can see that the cluster is coming up. So if we do a OC get cluster version, you can see it's coming up. It's not quite available yet. It's working towards completion of 438. And we can do an OC get cluster operators. So here you can see we've got a bunch of operators that are already up. They're finished processing, uh, but we have a few that are also in degraded. There's no version available or they're unknown. And these are because they're not available to run on the masters. So remember, I mentioned earlier the ingress controller. We didn't want the masters to be scheduled to prevent that from running on them. So what we need to do now is stand up our workers so the rest of our operators can come up. So. First thing, of course, we need for our workers is we need to create the networking ports for them. So just like the masters, we just went ahead and ran the same thing, except targeted the workers, created the two there. Now we're going to do the same thing we did again before for the masters, for the workers. And it's going to, again, use that Red Hat Core OS 4.3 image for OCP. And this time we're doing a 4-core, 8-gig, 30-gig disk image for our workers. So there's worker 1, or 0, and there's worker 1, which is our second worker. So because there's a UPI uh, and we've manually created these, we're going to have to manually approve the certificate requests. So what we're going to do is watch the OC get CSR for a few minutes and wait for that to come in with some pending statuses. Once those are done and pending, we're going to go ahead and get them. We'll examine one just to show you what it looks like. And once these pendings come in, we'll go ahead and grab the appropriate value and examine it. So you can see we now have two pending certificates. So we'll go ahead and stop the watch. And we're just going to run it manually so we can see the, the values more easily and copy them. So we're going to grab this first one and we're going to describe the CSR just so you can see what it is. So you can see this is for indeed worker zero. Uh, so all we're going to do now is we're going to do an OC ADM and we're going to approve the certificate request and we're going to do this for each of the certificates that are in pending. So OC ADM certificate approve and then the CSR value So it was approved, now we're going to do the exact same thing, but for the second pending one. Now each worker is going to end up with two certificates, so we're going to have two more that we're going to wait and watch for. And you can see they're already ready, so let's do a OC get CSR, and we're going to improve these two. So we'll grab this first one. if I put CSR on there. All right, and now let's grab that second pending one. All right, and now that's approved. So at this point, we can go ahead and make sure there's no more pending certificates. Everything looks good. So we can go ahead and do an OC get nodes and we can inspect the cluster, see that everything should be in a ready state. We've got our three masters and our two workers. So we can also do an OC get nodes dash o so not didn't want nodes twice. OC nodes dash o wide. And that'll show us a little bit more details on the master on the nodes. So now we're about ready to move on to one of the last steps. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and clear the screen again so we have a nice clean space. So just do a clear. And now normally uh, our, your storage, especially in an OpenStack, will be using that default Swift storage. In this particular cluster, I don't have access to the Swift storage myself. So instead what we're going to do is use an NFS backend. 
So remember earlier I mentioned that utility VM has an NFS server as well. And it's got a 100 gig that we have dedicated for this purpose. So what we're going to do is just examine one of those uh, files that we created ahead of time. Just to show you the PV definition. So you can see this is a persistent volume. It's 800 gigs. And it's read my many and it is on our utility VM and it's NFS so we're just gonna go ahead and quit this and now we're going to add it to the cluster we're gonna do an OC create dash F with this file and that's gonna create the resource on the cluster so you can see it successfully created now we're gonna do the same thing with the PVC so I have a very similar file we're just gonna examine it and you can see this one very very similar persistent volume claim everything else the same. So we're going to do the same thing again, OC create dash F with that PVC. So that was also successfully created. Now we need to go ahead and tell the registry to use this storage instead of the default Swift storage. So we're going to just going to run a quick OC patch command and tell it to replace the storage so it's now patched. At this point we are ready to check on our operators again. So we're going to do a watch OC get cluster operators. You can see the ingress controller has already come online. That was un unknown before. We see these rest of these are kind of progressing through and we're just going to wait for those to complete. And then at that point we'll be ready to move on to the last steps. So you can see now everything is done, everything is up, everything has a version, that's the right version, everything is available, nothing is progressing, nothing is degraded. So we're all good. So now what we're going to do is just finish up the install. So it's open shift install wait for install complete with our directory. You can see everything's done, it says install complete, and this now tells you how to access your cluster. So we're gonna, we can see the web console information here. We'll just go ahead and go back to our browser with that. And of course the certificate is not trusted because it's a self-signed certificate at this point. So we're just gonna go ahead and accept those. Let's move this off to the side so we can see our connection information again. Now you can see the user is kubeadmin with this randomly generated password. So we're just going to connect in with that. And there's our password. You can see we're now in our cluster. Uh, you can see everything is up to 4.3.8. There is an update available. And the control plane's all good. The cluster's good. You can go to projects, search. If we wanted to go ahead and do the upgrade, we can see that update button on the left. We can just go ahead and click on that, and that's going to go ahead and start rolling out the 4.3 update to the version we select. So in this case, we're going to do 4.3.18, which is the latest 4.3. Kick that off and see it's updating. It's got some ongoing activity. And if we go and look at our operators, we can watch from the command line as well as the dashboard as it kind of progresses and things start updating to 4.3.18. It's going to do rolling updates automatically, and we'll just go ahead and wait for that to complete and be ready to finish up. So you can see now everything is successfully rolled through. Every operator is at 4.3.18. Everything's available. Nothing is progressing. Nothing is degraded. We can see there are no ongoing activities. The OpenShift version is 4.3.18. Control plane and cluster are once again good. So everything is now complete. So the very last thing is what happens if any of these steps don't complete, if something goes wrong. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and we're just going to switch over to my notepad where I have some of these steps written down for you in case you ever need to reset. So if something goes wrong with your project, doesn't finish, or you just want to practice again, uh, give someone else a shot. You can go ahead and use these commands to clear up your environment and get everything back to normal and then proceed from where you backed up your install and everything should complete again. 
So thank you for watching this right along of an OpenShift 4.3 UPI user provision install. I hope this was instructive. And again, my name is Philip Cramp. Thanks.